Between the American Revolution and the Civil War, there are many important examples of workers organizing unions and struggling for their rights. But it was not until after the Civil War, when the industrialization of the country accelerated, that the forming of the modern union movement really began. As companies grew larger and more powerful, it was increasingly difficult for workers to maintain their wages. Employers fought bitterly against unions, and it became clear that working people needed a larger organization to coordinate the labor movement. In 1866, the National Labor Union was founded by William Silvis. The NLU hoped to unite local labor unions and the leagues advocating for an eight-hour workday. In 1868, Congress did pass legislation mandating the eight-hour day, but only for federal government workers. The NLU focused primarily on political goals rather than basic union actions, and in 1872 changed into the National Labor Reform Party. When its political aspirations failed, the National Labor Union faded away. As the country suffered from a severe economic downturn beginning with bank failures in 1873, Declining profits led the railroads to reduce wages several times in the following years. Already angry over increasingly dangerous working conditions, in July of 1877, rail workers in West Virginia abandoned their trains and refused to allow anyone to run them. Federal troops did manage to force the trains through, but the unrest was just beginning. Workers in many other industries left factories and shops in sympathy strikes until much of the working class around the nation was in the streets. Protests, riots, and violent clashes occurred in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Chicago, St. Louis, and other cities. State militias and federal troops were used to put down the uprisings, in some cases firing Gatling guns at unarmed crowds. Over a hundred people were killed, dozens of buildings were destroyed, thousands of locomotives and rail cars were ruined or damaged. The uprising lasted for almost 45 days. It was, in fact, not led or organized by unions, but rather was a spontaneous outbreak of anger, resentment against the railroad owners, the bankers, and the financiers was ignited by constant wage cuts and exploitation of the workers. It wasn't until President Hayes sent federal troops from city to city that the violence was ended and the strike broken. As one worker said, we were shot back to work. The Knights of Labor was the next group to attempt to create a national organization of workers. Founded in 1869, the Knights were ahead of their times in several ways. Their membership included tens of thousands of women and African Americans, and the organization advocated for equal pay for women and an end to child labor. When America suffered another major economic recession in 1883, the Knights were ready. Bank failures, the shady dealings of the railroad barons, and rampant speculation by investors triggered the crash. Thousands of businesses closed, and unemployment soared. Workers tried to resist the cuts in wages employers demanded, and there were numerous strikes. Most of these failed, but some involving the Knights of Labor succeeded. Of greatest significance were the victories of the railroad shops over financier Jay Gould and his Wabash Railroad. When Gould refused to stop targeting the Knights members for layoffs, they were able to shut down traffic on his system and force him to talk. The country witnessed the first negotiation between a national labor federation and the owner of one of the largest railroads. In a widely publicized meeting, Terence Powderly, head of the Knights, and Jay Gould reached an agreement. Powderly would end the strike, and Gould would stop targeting Knights members for layoffs. Workers across the nation rushed to join the Knights, and the huge expansion in membership led to loss of control and disorder. Overconfident local unions began actions without sufficient preparation and without approval from the Knights leaders, and this had grim consequences. A strike against the Texas and Pacific Railway in 1886 
gave Gould an opportunity to hit back, and he was prepared to use it. Pinkerton agents and replacement workers were employed to keep the trains rolling, and there were no negotiations with the Union. In less than two months, the strike was crushed. Conservative newspapers depicted Powderly as a dangerous radical, able to dictate to the nation using the threat of strikes, and public opinion was turned against the organization. Following Gould's example, other companies refused to bargain and strove to destroy the Knights' influence. In the next few years, dozens of strikes were crushed, and many workers lost faith in Potterly and his federation. From a high of about 700,000 members in 1886, the Knights dwindled to only 100,000 by 1890. A more lasting national organization, the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, was founded during the turbulent 1880s. Led by Samuel Gompers, the AFL adopted a strategy far different from the Knights of Labor. The AFL focused on wages and working conditions and organizing skilled workers rather than industrial laborers. Political activities were left to other allied groups. Gompers believed that the cause of labor was best served by the unions fighting for small, obtainable goals. This strategy proved to be very successful. With the decline of the Knights, the AFL eventually became the dominant force in the American labor movement. By 1900, the AFL represented well over 500,000 members. While not a huge organization, the AFL was effective, well-led, and careful in choosing its fights. The 1880s railroad strikes took place in the context of a nationwide movement for an eight-hour workday. This had been a goal of unions for decades. In the first few days of May 1886, hundreds of thousands of workers across the country went on strike for this cause. After a rally on May 3rd, a large group of workers in Chicago went to the McCormick Harvesting Machine Company to harass strike breakers. To protect the replacements, McCormick brought in 300 police officers. In the clash that followed, the officers opened fire on the crowd, numerous strikers were wounded, and at least one was killed. Local radicals held a rally at the Haymarket Square the following day in support of those shot at McCormick. The event took place peacefully until police charged in and an unknown assailant threw a bomb into the middle of their formation. The police again opened fire and men and women were shot at random. But due to the smoke and confusion, many of those shot were police officers. Between the bombing and the gunfire, seven officers and four civilians were killed, and dozens were wounded. This provided an excellent excuse for a witch hunt against anyone advocating for working people. Evidence was both found and manufactured. Witnesses were interviewed, bribed, and coached. Dozens of labor activists were arrested, and eight were brought to trial for murder. The prosecution admitted they didn't know who threw the bomb, but all eight were convicted on the premise that these men didn't stop the bombing and had advocated for strife. Several had not even been at Haymarket at that time, but seven of the accused were sentenced to death and one to 15 years in prison. His crime was editing a radical newspaper. Of the seven sentenced to death, two repudiated their beliefs and had their sentences commuted to life in prison. The remaining five refused to do that and were left to die. One committed suicide the night before his planned execution, and the last four were hung. Seven years later, Illinois Governor John Peter Altgeld determined that all eight had been unjustly convicted, and he pardoned the three who remained alive. Bloodshed during the May 1886 eight-hour strikes was not confined to Chicago. For example, in Bayview, Wisconsin, just south of Milwaukee, seven people were killed when the state militia fired on a crowd of eight-hour strikers on May 5th of that year. The great injustice done in Chicago led to international outrage. May 1st has since been celebrated worldwide in commemoration of those executed considered martyrs by many labor groups. 
In some countries, May 1st is designated as Labor Day. The Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, considered the most powerful union in the AFL, struck and won a three-year contract with the Carnegie Steel Company in Homestead, Pennsylvania in 1889. When that contract was up for renewal in June 1892, Andrew Carnegie and his manager Henry Frick had already decided to use the opportunity to destroy the union. They countered the union's wage demands with a proposal for a 22% pay cut. As Frick had planned, negotiations broke down completely, and on June 29th, he locked the union out of the plant. The Amalgamated represented only the skilled workers, about 10% of the labor force. Nevertheless, the 3,000 unskilled and unrepresented workers voted to support the Amalgamated craftsmen. Tensions escalated quickly as the company tried to get replacement workers into the plant and the union tried to keep them out. A force of Pinkerton agents attempted to gain entrance, but the union was ready and a gunfight broke out. Both groups suffered fatalities and injuries. Eventually, the Pinkertons were surrounded and gave up when union leaders promised them safe passage out of town. Unfortunately, as they were leaving, the agents were assaulted with stones and clubs. In spite of union officials trying to stop the carnage, several Pinkertons were beaten unconscious, while horrified newspaper reporters looked on. This was the day the strike was lost. Before this event, much of the country was in support of the workers. But with the news of the violence against the unarmed men, public opinion turned against the Union. The entire country's attention was focused on the Homestead strike when an anarchist, unrelated to the Union, attempted to assassinate Frick. He failed to kill him, but did injure him severely. This was the final straw for the public. The Union was so thoroughly broken that the Carnegie Steel plant, soon to become U.S. Steel, remained non-union for 40 more years. This loss then set in motion a fierce campaign to de-unionize all the steel mills in Pennsylvania. And by 1900, not a single unionized mill existed in the state. The Pullman Palace Car Company built and operated luxurious railway cars. Employees were required to live in the company town just south of Chicago, and while the town was modern and well-designed, life there was highly regulated and not inexpensive. A serious economic downturn in 1893 led the company to cut wages by 25%, but rents and other costs in the company town were not reduced, and many people were left without enough to buy food or fuel. When worker representatives trying to meet with company owner George Pullman were fired, the employees walked out. Many of the workers immediately joined the American Railway Union, led by Eugene Debs, and together they launched a nationwide boycott of any train that included Pullman's cars. Much of the rail traffic west of Chicago soon ground to a halt. While Debs consistently spoke against violence, the railroad owners did not want a prolonged peaceful strike. With Illinois Governor Altgeld sympathetic to the workers, the railroad companies wanted federal troops to use force to get the trains moving again. They placed mail cars in every train along with Pullman cars. Since it is a federal offense to interfere with the mail, the government would be forced to take action. The U.S. Attorney General, who openly supported the owners, deputized over 3,000 men hired by the railroads to keep the trains running. Clashes broke out between the deputies and workers, and this provided justification for President Cleveland to send in federal troops. Trains started rolling again, and angry strikers turned violent. Railroad property was looted and burned. Dozens were shot and several killed in clashes. While there was widespread destruction and violence, Newspapers across the country carried exaggerated reports implying that Chicago was gripped by anarchy. The owners obtained a federal injunction against the strike, including an order forbidding the union leaders from even communicating with members. 
Debs and other union leaders were arrested, leaving no one in charge. Scattered violence continued, but the workers realized they were beaten and gradually returned to work. The strike was crushed. Both owners and unions learned the power that federal intervention and injunctions gave to big business fighting labor. President Cleveland appointed a commission to investigate the strike and its causes. The resulting report demonstrated remarkable foresight. It called for recognition of unions as a necessary and useful force to guide workers. It suggested organized labor should be granted the same privileges as corporations, along with the same regulations. Finally, it scolded the government, quote, for not adequately controlling monopolies and corporations and for failing to reasonably protect the rights of labor and redress its wrongs, unquote. Unfortunately, actions on these recommendations were decades away. Although labor lost many of these early battles, the nation was forced to recognize the suffering of so many working people. Conditions in factories were easy to ignore, but burning buildings and deaths in the street were not. <laughs>